Here we are once again, getting back into Grey Hack. We are booting up, loading in. There we go. Got my desktop from last time when I was playing around. It's still up there. That's great. A um, couple of things I wanted to try before I move on to another title. Um, have been enjoying Grey Hack. I was going to um, uh, record a couple more on this game. Because there's just a couple more things that I really felt like um, I wanted to check out, see how well the game handles. And I had a couple of comments, uh, things, people reminding me of um, things to try. I'm looking for one particular comment right now. Is it on the last part, perhaps? I guess while we're doing that, let's... Get our notepad back up. Uh, yes. Uh, so we had a commenter on part five uh, reminding me that when you buy exploits, you can indeed get the source code version. Um, and then we'll be able to uh, use the code editor to see what they do, which I am interested in doing. So there's a couple of them that I've already used. Uh, they also said this is, by the way, the commenter uh, Rubino. You'll start noticing some patterns in the exploit names. And I, I did actually already begin to see that. I thought that the names were, the names and the descriptions were procedurally generated probably from a couple of lists. So a list of potential names and a list of uh, potential exploit types or uh, something like that. But then I noticed um, when I came back into the game later uh, that the exploit names and descriptions seemed to be consistent. And a couple of the exploits I already had in the combination that I had them were already there. Um, was it SMTP? Yeah, so base, triad, ebase, I have these already. So, we had success before uh, with this zero und hound h um so let's get the source code version of that that's pricey i was spending all kinds of money i didn't even realize it uh so there it is save this is the one that i was using on i think it was the mission to change grades or something like the second or third one i did so uh what it says to do it just says get access to a shell minimum number of users that are starting the computer is two so let's see if we can take a closer look at the exploit and figure out why in the code that might be. Now, I did dip my toes into the code editor last time, and it was um, a lot of fun. It made a lot of sense. Um, similar syntax to Python, so it was not too hard to, to jump in. So here we are. This is our exploit here. I suppose it's, it's not zero, and it's probably owned hund anyway uh so if params length is not equal to or params uh first argument equals dash h or params first argument does help then uh usage program split slash ip address port okay so first line just says you know if uh the number of parameters is not exactly equal to two or if the first parameter is a an indicator that we're looking for help, then it spits out usage, program path, and then IP address port. Just to tell the user, hey, we need the IP address and port for this exploit to work. Okay. Then it does the same check that I uh, realized in uh, my own little script uh, that you need to make sure that meta exploit is available so then it does that check to see if the library is there if not it spits out an error message uh, it's um, then takes the parameters that are passed into it which there should be two again exactly two if we spit more than that then it's going to spit it back an error uh, address and port have to be in that order um, converts the port to an int okay Net session, meta exploit, net use. Uh, so there's a, a function in the meta exploit um, that uh, package that uh, has a net use for address and port. So basically, um, opens up that address and port. Listening to that, uh, can't connect to net session if not. 
Metal lib, net session, dump lib. Um, there we go. So that's how it's, now we're actually getting into the meat of how it actually works. Right about here. Uh, result. Uh, met, uh, metal lib overflow. Um, emap add if we go to the manual. And scripting and looking for the meta lib uh meta exploit load meta lib overflow there it is takes a memory address uh an unsec value and then any optional arguments exploits the indicated vulnerability through the buffer overflow method so um well, we'll get to the rest of that in a second, but that's what it's, this is supposed to be a memory address, which it's the hex version of a memory address. That's, that's valid. Uh, emap add is the unsec string. Um, if not result, then exit program ended. If result equals shell, then start terminal. So there's not actually much to it. It's still, it's still hiding a lot of the exploits uh, functionality, a lot of the actual mechanism behind um, some obfuscation here, which I would expect. Uh, I mean, honestly, let's take a look at a different exploit and, and compare them then. Um, ba -ba browser. Let's compare it to uh, base here. Take advantage of a vulnerability in the SMTP service to inject a new password to a registered user, any login user. So let's grab this. Save, close. Now we can't do a side by side. I forgot we don't have that functionality in the UI. Okay. All right. So uh, sparse both. So here we have again. Um, yeah, here is where things actually get started. It does the same thing. Metalib overflow memory address s push par and then a new pass parameter are passed to it. So hiding uh, both in both cases a lot of what the actual exploit mechanism is. Both of them use this uh, quote unquote overflow function in the metalib. Um, all right, so uh, in terms of hacking themed games, what I'm seeing here exceeds my expectations. But I have to admit largely because my expectations are fairly low to begin with. So let's compare this to um, a more reasonable exploit here. Let me uh, see if I can find one right quick. Okay, I think I got a good example here. <clears throat> so um a couple of months ago there was a cve released a cve uh is a uh, well let's say uh, well i'm assuming that if you're listening to this you're probably familiar with what it is um but just on the off chance that you're not uh, a cve is known for common vulnerabilities and exposures it is an alert that is created and categorizes exploits based on a number of different criteria um, and those criteria vary i won't get into the details right here but it's a way of cataloging and gauging risk with certain exploits so back in february as you see here this is uh, february 17th 22 uh, the, a cve was released and they're categorized by year and then there's an ordinal number that goes along with it so this one was cve 2022 20, uh, 69.9 um, this is what we see um, in cybersecurity when an exploit is made public. Um, this is the de when when an, when an exploit becomes public, as in it's officially recognized as an exploit, and uh, and everyone kind of goes into action on it. It's when a CVE is released. Um, that, that, not that they don't exist before that, they most certainly do. As a matter of fact, usually by the time a CVE is released, it's already old news in most circles in cybersecurity, but a CVE is officially, you have no more excuse for not dealing with this. This is a problem you need to address in some fashion. Um, so this was prepared by the Deepwatch Intel threat team. 
Uh, proof of concept exploit code was publicly released. Uh, that is a, a bad thing. Uh, it means that anybody who can get to that code may be able to modify it uh, and use it to attack. Um, most lazy attackers these days simply use Metasploit, which are uh, analog here in Greyhack as Meta Exploit. But um, Metasploit uh, is basically a package uh, for offensive security where exploits can be bundled up and then you can simply launch them from a console. It's all very easy kind of stuff. Um, so in terms of the in-game analog here, this is just fine. Like most of the uh, packages in Metasploit, I mean, I've used, I use them all the time. Do I know specifically how most of them really work? Well, no, because they're already packaged. I've never had, uh, I've never had to reverse engineer them or, or write my own for, for most of those packages. Um, but are they always reliable? Well, no, of course not, because until there's a Metasploit package, you're doing the work manually. And so when I'm looking at the source code, uh, what I'm looking at here, this source code basically just says <laughs> run a Metasploit package and then attack this memory address, which we'll get to in a moment because... An overflow is a very specific kind of thing. What I uh, what I was hoping to see is something more along the lines of actual POC code, which let's get back to that exploit and I'll show you. So this alert says that proof of concept exploit code was publicly released. Threat actor could exploit this vulnerability by sending malicious HTTP queries to a vulnerable SSL VPN gateway device. If the exploit is successful, the attacker can gain remote ex code execution with root privileges on the target device. So in terms of CVE, as I said, they're ranked by severity. Um, a remote code execution with root privileges uh, is kind of a worst case scenario. A little bit but this is just an alert that gives you an overview of everything right what we really want to do is we want to see the code and this link publicly available goes to the github where this has been uh, posted so our demansky here radic demansky on their github apparently they have um the code posted we get some more details here i'm not specifically here to talk about this exploit so so I have to say this is just more background and should be stack based buffer overflow so this is also an overflow attack that's good um proper memory configure exploitation so here is the shell code so um what a metasploit package would do is package this up and then um basically make it super easy to run in metasploit you would just use the exploit find the target find the exploit run the exploit on the target uh, but this is what uh, we would be looking at on the on the back end here this is assembly code um, which is a very low level programming language if you're not familiar with it um, most exploits are gonna i mean they could be written in many different languages from python but assembly is not unusual um, simply because so many targets speak assembly. Uh, so this is what I was hoping to see, right? So if we went through this code, we could reverse engineer this and, and follow the assembly, um, all of these moves and these subs and, and all of this, uh, reassemble this and, uh, and figure out exactly what's happening on the back end and, and how the exploit works compared with all of this nice write up on exactly what it's doing. Um, we would have, uh, much less of a, of a problem, you know? figuring it out. Uh, but we're not really getting that here with uh, with uh, these uh, sort of exploits sources. Uh, uh, we're basically just getting uh, pseudocode here that just says to run an overflow attack at an address and then one of these um, unsec strings. What do they, what do they actually call it? Unsec? Yeah, string unsec value. So um, I'm not not disappointed but um it would have been nice to see something uh something there more than this a little more substance but that's actually okay uh, because i also got a message from a another commenter um they actually sent me an email they left a comment but they also sent an email oh and i haven't checked my email all day so i know i've been uh, meaning to uh, play more gray hack 
but it's been on the back burner because I have been playing a lot of Project Zomboid. Sorry to say. Uh, I'm not in. Not sorry. It, it's a good game. <laughs> All right. So this commenter Duck01 uh, sent me some source code that I can paste into Greyhack here. Um, they say it's a special script that utilize that analyzes computer vulnerabilities on the go for a given IP address. The utility is not mine. It's called Subnet. I've tweaked it a bit with some useful features, but it's still not perfect. The main problem now is that. Not all vulnerabilities are recognized and exploited correctly. Uh, I'm finalizing it, so you can use it in the next video. Well, we will we will take a look. Open up code editor here, so I have somewhere to paste. Let's take a look at it before we we mess with it. Um, oh, sketch shell, host computer, okay. Here, let's clip to, clip to, 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 okay, so, uh, better exploits, so this is the uh, two dependencies that we have here. Clean equals function string while type uh string index of new line, new line does not equal null string, new line, new line okay. Colors. Well, I, I I always appreciate the uh, always appreciate a little uh, attention to presentation here. So we have different color codings for different uh, types of messages, and your warnings and your informational messages and so on. We've got a log function. Uh, where goes the log? Just prints it. Okay. Input. I'm actually going to... I should have opened it in plus plus instead of notepad. But that's okay, because there's a code editor here that will help us color code things. Holy moly. Okay, here we go. Oh, uh, here's where we were. Okay. So there's an input function. Slice. And we have an array of letters here. I don't I don't know what that's about. But maybe it's possible. I just don't know enough about what's going on, or I don't know enough about the game. Um, is, is this just, this is just a horizontal rule function? All size, size, and well, okay. Uh, I shouldn't have gotten rid of the manual. Round. I mean, the round is, should be a mathematical function. It looks like it is. Well, size is greater than I, I well, size, pushing size B. So the array B with the index value of I is returned. What? Is this for the log size? Oh, okay. Uh, gotcha. I see. I I uh, messed up in my head the uh, logic of the while loop here. Okay. All right. Understood. Go 
colors, format file. <clears throat> okay, check access. Check access seems... Oh, okay. It's, I was going to say it seems long, and then I just realized it's because it's checking three different permission levels. Okay. Next function. Through blah, blah, blah. Checks for cat usage. Okay. Checks for remove per if command equals rm then okay cd no oh, this it did it iterates it's looking for <laughs> steal money uh it's checking to see what you can do i mean that's that would be useful i've already been stumbling through that on my own doing it manually is a problem when i'm trying to type around a microphone so that's good check port Okay. Scanning for vulnerabilities. Well, I uh, ghost O one. I can say I'm dead. Actually, going to go ahead and save this one here. I mean, uh, this is nice work. Um, looks like it's uh, looks like it's a useful one. Oh, you know what? I uh, just remembered before I go trying anything here. Uh, I just remembered that I didn't talk about um, overflow. So, um, as I said. Uh, and overflow is a very specific kind of thing. So, um, when an application is instantiated, it's going to require uh, some resources in order to run. So if you are thinking about, for example, uh, if we look at... Uh, here we go. If we look at um, Ghost's code here, for example, there is a variable here, which is an array, b equals an array of bkm, gt, etc. And each of these holds an index position. When this code runs, it's going to require resources in order to run, right? So uh, we were just talking about assembly a moment ago. When a, an application is written in a programming language, a programming language is a pseudo language between, in this case, English and what is raw machine code. So the computer understands machine code, people do not. Uh, people understand English, computers do not. And a programming language is a bridge between the two. It's a pseudo language that both we and a computer can understand as long as we write it in the correct syntax for the programming language and then compile it so that the computer can then understand it. Um, assembly instructions are low level language, is a low level language uh, that essentially uh, programs uh, instructions for CPUs. So a very low level, almost machine code, right? When we say low level, it's closer to machine code than, for example, uh, English. So you, like if we were to have a hierarchy of languages in terms of their syntax and complexity and their closeness to what would be raw binary, uh, they would be, the English language would be far off on one side and then we would have languages like C and then we would have assembly and then we would have on the other far side would be raw binary you know code for for machine code um, when that's instantiated in addition to those instructions well i should say part of those instructions are going to require things like reserving memory addresses to hold variables in this case ghost's programming uh, program here uh, has a variable b which is an array an array is a fixed um that's not going to change. There is no user input that would unpredictably uh, uh, cause that array to become larger or smaller because the array is programmed into the code, right? 
this B variable will always equal this every time the application runs. Now, when uh, there is a variable that uh, is fixed in that fashion, then it will reserve a predictable amount of memory in the smallest possible increment, which would be a single byte, all the way up into many different bytes. But memory addresses can will hold a finite amount of space, right? So even if I have a single bit that must be reserved, there's a fixed a memory address is a fixed amount of data, and it will just simply not use all of the extra data. Um, Sometimes variables will exceed a single memory address, and when that happens, then there are going to be multiple memory addresses that will be reserved uh, in that case. When it is instantiated and it is a fixed value, a known quantity at application runtime, then it will reserve memory address in a more orderly place in memory known as the stack. And then there are some variables, like for example, if an application were to ask you what your name is, uh, or it's going to rely on user input and a user may input any number of different values, then it may reserve memory in a more ad hoc state known as the heap. In either event, it's a fixed amount of data. So let's say, for example, if I were to write an application that, let's say, reserved uh, eight bytes for a variable, and then user input somehow managed to exceed that value, or I was able to somehow otherwise exceed that value. Essentially, I want to write a value uh, in a way that exceeds the number of memory addresses that have been reserved for that variable. Well, that may be, well, that would be a, a buffer overflow, or not a buffer, well, that would be a buffer overflow, that would be a type of overflow. But really, uh, most of the time when we're talking about application exploits, when we're talking about an overflow attack, well, let me show you. I have a diagram I use in class sometimes that's a little bit more instructive. All right, so a couple diagrams here. Um, first one here is RAM memory allocation. As I just mentioned, there's two discrete parts, uh, essentially where variables are going to be allocated. The stack, which is a more orderly uh, um, uh, place where our memory is allocated in as contiguous a fashion as possible, and the heap where it is allocated on an ad hoc basis at application runtime. Uh, the heap is for dynamically allocated variables, whereas the stack is going to be for fixed or uh, automatic local variables. Um, an overflow attack, uh, again, um, is, it could mean a couple of different things. Uh, it could mean, essentially, that there has been discrete memory addresses that have been reserved for a variable, and a variable exceeds the allocated memory space. Now, when that alone happens, generally what happens is you just simply have an app crash. The application will simply terminate. But an attack, what we're actually trying to do is we want to... Uh, and the, I'm sorry, the reason that the application will crash uh, is one of a couple of different things. Number one, potentially exploit mitigation. There's a lot of uh, uh, inherent built-in OS application exploit mitigation that will cause it to crash. Uh, for example, Windows uses things called data execution prevention. Uh, and essentially what that means is that, well, um, all right, let me back up just a little bit here just real quick. Um, so because application and an application is reserving a certain amount of space, that memory space is still shared among all applications on the machine, including the operating system itself, meaning that there has to be some kind of discrete uh, demarcation between applications. So essentially, uh, variables that are stored for my calculator application should not be able to access uh, memory addresses that are currently allocated for variables for my browser uh, or Excel or what have you. Um, to do so would be a breach, right? That's a security leak right there. Um, so we don't want that to happen. Uh, we especially don't want an application that has, let's say, lower privileges from being able to execute uh, any code that may be stored for applications running at a higher privilege level. That would be bad. And there are certain parts of memory which are going to be earmarked, allocated for the operating system, and we definitely don't want anything executed in that fashion. So as I said, uh, most of the time when you have just a simple overflow, we have an app crash due to data execution prevention. Also, possibly because of um, an overflow can just bog up the system. It can 
screw up the application and it may try to execute code at a memory address that is now uh, either doesn't exist or doesn't contain any value, uh, viable code and so the application crashes when we do a no buffer overflow attack maybe sometimes we're looking to crash an application that's a kind of denial of service attack uh, it's a local denial of service attack um, but usually what we want to do with the buffer overflow attack is we want to trick the application into executing code at either a higher privilege level than we currently have or malicious code that the application would not otherwise have right so in this case uh you can see here on the left hand side we have our application normal run space everything seems to be fine we got functions parameters and uh we have a uh, buffer uh, which is uh, essentially a place to to hold those variables when user input occurs, and all of those uh, are going to have the the buffers are going to have return functions and base pointers in order to get us back to the place in code uh, where the variable was originally called. Right? We need to get back to the application so it can continue to normally run. Well, there's a couple of things that we try to do with a buffer overflow attack, and I'm not going to go into all of them here because that's not really what we're talking about, but um, what we're talking about with the metalib overflow function, we're providing a memory address and then some unsec string that goes along with it. We could say that that unsec sec string is an analog for any arbitrary code um, so for example with uh, gray hack here um, this is looking to just start a shell right so this em uh, emap add that could simply be bin bash right it's just a shell we're just trying to open a shell um, so we could have any arbitrary code and, you know, shell code injection is a thing. Um, I, I, I actually teach it in my offensive security classes, uh, in assembly. It's one of the first things that my students write in assembly is shell code. Um, where was I? Oh yeah. Um, so yeah. Oh, that's right. Let's get back to the diagram. Okay. So, um, in this case, you know, the, uh, the, the code could be any arbitrary malicious code but what we want to do is we actually want to overwrite the uh, return or well we want to over overwrite one of the pointers um, instead of going back to the application to run its code we want it instead to jump to our malicious code so we want to put our code into memory and then we want the application to call it or uh, we want some privileged um, uh, application to call it instead and then that way we can have a shell with privileges higher than we otherwise would be able to start on our own on the system right so that would be a pointer overflow attack so there's many different kinds of overflow attacks um, buffer overflow attacks pointer overflow attacks or, or stack overflows or, or whatever uh, there's many different ways to get your code into memory you know you can you can do shell code injection. You can do heap spraying or whatever, whatever it takes to get in there. We're not talking about the specific details in this one, but that is more or less what we're, we're looking at in terms of an analog here with gray hack and, and what kind of is happening. Um, these hex values for memory addresses, absolutely accurate. Um, these I'm not too mad at because it could be any arbitrary code. You know, it doesn't matter specifically what it is. Um, it's, it is kind of obfuscated here a little bit because this is more of a, a Metasploit module than actual code, but hey, it's um, it's an analog, and it's one of the better analogs I've seen in, in these kinds of games. Um, so let's uh, let's try giving uh, Ghost 01's code here a try, but first I need to pick up a job. I don't think I have one right now. Uh, that's the email I got before that I was saving. I don't have the rep yet for... Nope, I'm level one. I don't have the rep yet for legitimate jobs. We're up to three. Yep. Nope. Nope. Got to, got to continue to do the dirty work. Uh, okay, so we did police record and academic changes. Uh, I wanted to try credentials needed and find and delete remote file. We got a couple of rep zero jobs here we could uh, we could drop in on, uh, but let's try this. Let's try this first one. Client wants access to the remote machine. Client wants the login credentials of any user on the remote machine. Okay. So we're looking for login credentials. 
Uh, oh, did we crash? I think, nope. Okay, we're good. All right, client wants the to 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 Still not sure what the deal is here. We've been uh, connected here to Gillenber uh, this whole time. It's the strongest Wi-Fi signal that we have. I haven't seen a need yet to to switch. Still haven't had to use the admin monitor thing either, whatever the heck that is. So. All right, remote IP, local IP. Any user on their own machine. Uh, it's important that you access the correct machine behind the public key, okay? Uh, SSH and HTTP. I know I already have a couple of these SSH ones here. Uh, 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 somewhere. Yes. Kinks. Uh, I probably should have read what it did before. Okay, it reads the... Okay, gotcha. Trial and error uh, is one way to go. I could... I could check. Um, something else. I thought I had more SSH volumes. Here, let me uh, organize this a little bit here. Whoa, 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 hey, now. Uh, SMTP. Oh, goodness. Am I going to have to do this for every... Oh, no. Oh, dear. It doesn't allow for multi-select, and it doesn't do... Okay, well... Hmm, that's going to make organization something of a problem. I mean, I could just use the command line. Probably should have been more organized to begin with. And now the question is, is will I be able to ignore not enough free space? Of course not. Of course not. That's how they get you. All right, let's not worry about it right now. Um, okay. Take advantage of vulnerability as it serves and different new password into a registered user. I'm going to assume that there is a registered user. Oh, now I gotta delete shit. Why do I not have enough disk space? I don't still have... Alright, well, this ain't working anyway. Oh, wait, do it. Uh, it's, 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 it's... Nope, 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 nope. No, I don't want you. What the hell? Oh, okay, I was going to say, do I have a UI stuck issue here? Alright, cancel. No, no, cancel. Alright, we, we have, yep, we have UI issue here. Definitely have a UI issue here. These are... These are stuck. It broke. It broke, did. Okay, let's try to ignore them for now. Press ahead with the mission.
Oh, of course. Uh, password one. Okay. Password for user as Wayne W. So, I mean, <laughs> technically at this point, <laughs> technically at this point, I'm done because <laughs> I just changed their credentials. I wonder, can I? <laughs> There we go. I mean, it's done. Customer satisfied with the job. <laughs> All right, that one, that, one, that one was pretty funny. I mean, the job is done. And see, now I've covered my tracks as a dangerous real-world hacker. I've deleted the email, so there is no more trace. Yeah, it actually reminds me. Of something else I, I touched on before, uh, which is the the whole you know connecting to a random Wi-Fi networks thing. I see that that is a theme a lot in uh, in hacking themed games, uh, where you're kind of hopping from from Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi, you know, breaking people's passwords and logging in and stuff. And of course, that's all good fun uh, and all, but in terms of opsec and um, how a real-life computer criminal would go about covering their tracks. It's a really poor um, thing to rely on in order to preserve your anonymity and not get caught. Um, so my my specialty, in terms of research anyway, uh, is is forensics. I'm, I've always been really interested in solving puzzles and mysteries and that kind of a thing, so I, I like forensics. And network forensics is a special animal. Don't get me wrong. Um, and it's not necessarily one that everyone has tons of exposure to, which is why I'm also not surprised that most games get it kind of wrong uh, a lot of times as well. Um, but um, when you make a web request, you have a client, it's a server that you're reaching out to over the public internet, and when you type in a URL, there needs to be a translation done. That's why there are DNS servers all over the world that do that translation, uh, going from people-friendly URL to IP address, um, and uh, the primary DNS server that you, you reach out to when you make a web request is probably going to be with your internet service provider or maybe with another large DNS provider like, for example, Google. Google's DNS servers are open, available, and free for all at 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 .8 .8, um, or 8.8.4.4 .4 .4 if you use their backup. Um, every request that you make... Uh, is going to go through that DNS server. It's going to do that translation for you. Now, uh, when you have an internet service provider, that internet service provider is going to provide you with a public IP, and as far as the translation goes, the web request is going to appear to come from that public IP, and then your router that you have you know, probably commercially available from whatever big box department store is closest to you, does what's known as network address translation in order to convert your private IP address, which is probably a 192168 address, into your uh, public uh, address and routes internally all of those web requests to the correct device. But it is not at all hidden right so just because the dns server your internet service provider can see your public ip and your web request doesn't mean they necessarily know which device it went to directly but it's not that hard to figure out number one if the police are able to eavesdrop on your network and if you can break into their wi-fi uh, other people probably can too and anybody who operates that network with access to that equipment that router is able to see that there is a device and which web requests go with which because of that network address translation service so it's not at all secure and even though it might make it a little bit more difficult to figure out exactly who you are it's not actually that difficult because in addition to the information that's being provided in the web request that internal uh, networking equipment on the router side collects a lot more information about your device when it's connected for example its mac address uh, host name and so on are all going to be sent freely and uh, and lovingly to the local networking equipment in order to establish that connection so uh you you may be you may think that's safe because it's your neighbor's wi-fi and they don't know computers very well that's fine but i don't know who gillen br is in this game and if that's for example law enforcement setting up a wi-fi maybe as part of a sting operation they're collecting my information 
and they can see everything. Uh, true anonymity on networking comes from taking steps to change what is your actual designators, things that are, are actually used to identify you uh, in general, right? So just like in real life, uh, an analog would be wearing rubber gloves to prevent fingerprints or wearing a mask so that your face can't be identified. The identifying features on a network of a computer system are going to be things, like I said, like the MAC address, uh, the host name, the IP address, and so on. So steps for anonymity that we would normally take would be to try to change that or hide those or obfuscate them at least a little bit. And in terms of um, your Mac, there's Mac address scramblers in terms of um, hiding your IP even or the web request in general uh, from both the local system and the internet service provider and so on is through the use of virtual private networks um, in terms of uh, preventing tracing from the server side back to the client using things like onion routing and so on, although that's much, much less of a sure thing than it once was many years ago. At this point, there's more exit nodes that are operated by law enforcement probably than uh, are legitimately run by, you know, people on uh, the, the onion um, network. Um, and as far as your host name goes, of course, you can change your host name anytime you want to, but it's a good idea to do that anyway or uh, or what have you. Um, the best OPSEC for networking and in general would be to use a, uh, a live boot OS. So not, for example, I have a, in gray, gray hack here, I have a desktop set up. It's all customized. I changed the theme and everything. If I was really worried about OPSEC, I would not care if it remembered my desktop. I would want a fresh new OS every time. I don't want anything to be saved. Live boot OSs will essentially be created um, ad hoc instead of being saved disk everything is running in memory uh, some examples of those would be for example Kali live although for true anonymity tails is a better option or was a better option um, and then taking advantage of privacy enhancing technologies on top of that so using tails taking advantage of the max scrambler making sure VPNs on um, and and so on those would be much better steps um, why am I giving, I shouldn't be giving everyone tips on how to do this. So I may cut that part out. Probably should. But I will also say, <laughs> now that I've said all of that, um, as somebody who is who is an expert in digital forensics, will all of that stop a truly determined investigator from locating your identity? Uh, I have to tell you no uh it's it's really not all of the things that i just mentioned um, might make it more difficult uh certainly more frustrating but it's still not going to be impossible there's it, it is impossible low cards exchange principle the foundation upon which all forensics is based can be summarized as every contact leaves a trace all that i've just said is how computer criminals which you should never be um, can make themselves more anonymous but the truth of the matter is, is that anytime you have contact with something else you're going to leave some kind of a trace some kind of an impression and uh, those are clues and the clues will add up and you will be found out all right, so uh, we did. We haven't done a corrupt data yet, although I'm I'm at just about 50 minutes, which is kind of my limit for these episodes. I don't want everyone to get too bored, so I guess we'll just do the one mission uh, today. Next time, I want to do a corrupt data and a get remote file, the two mission types that we haven't done yet. If I manage to make it to level two, I will try some of the white hat jobs as my karma is it uh, looks to be in the garbage a little bit um, and then i will give multiplayer a try before i am done with the game so we will see you next time i don't feel like i got a lot of xp for that job i'm gonna have to make sure to make a mental note next time to check and see how much experience does it say how much experience i'm getting no oh well i didn't mean to accept the job but okay We'll, we'll do that one next time too, I guess. Okay. Um, take care. See you on, uh, on the next part.